Thank you very much indeed for this very kind introduction. And uh, especially, I'm very grateful uh, for the opportunity um, to be here and to talk to you about uh, um, how I think we can continue um, Christian thinking um, in the present, into the future, especially if we find our way back to the, what is, uh, to the origins of what is genuinely um, and specifically Christian in the uh, European history of uh, philosophical and theological thought. Okay, um, well we are uh, here uh, for the same end obviously, but as you will notice this lecture is coming from um, somewhat different direction than the others that we have um, uh, heard so far at this conference because it is coming from the, it is coming from the analytical side <laughs> of the uh, contemporary philosophical landscape rather than the continental, which uh, the other lectures have um, uh, mostly uh, originated from. But um, I can assure you already at this point that despite this divergence in their background and starting point, um, these lectures will eventually converge precisely because they are going to target the same end, this end being the continuation of Christian thinking and the present into the future. Now, so having this happy thought in mind, uh, I would uh, suggest we get down to business and start wading through the swampy area of uh, contemporary analytical philosophy, perhaps getting somewhere where we all can meet. Um, so let me start with another disquieting suggestion, a la McIntyre. Looking at the contemporary scene in philosophy, it would seem obvious that metaphysics, pronounced dead multiple times in modern philosophy, is making a spectacular comeback in this century. After all, analytical metaphysics, a phrase that would have sounded to many, to many philosophers like an oxymoron, even as late as the 70s or 80s of the last century, is now the legitimate description of an area of specialization in job postings of many respectable departments of philosophy. So apparently, these days, metaphysics is undergoing a miraculous resurrection. But is this really a resurrection of a dead body? Or is the situation rather like the case of a dead body appearing to be moving and hence alive merely because of the maggots feasting on it? <laughs> or, <laughs> to, use a less to use a less offensive metaphor, aren't we contemporary practitioners of the discipline like scavengers among the ruins of a fallen cathedral, picking up some pieces here and there, trying to fit them into our modern houses, say, putting a gargoyle over the mantelpiece and a stained glass window into the bathroom, never quite realizing their proper function and how they would fit together. To have that realization, um, what we would need is not just the pieces, but rather the blueprint, the form of the whole that is now gone. Indeed, seen in, the light, seen in the light of this metaphor, we live in a historical period that is after that form is gone, but which is also a time when we should be after that form, namely in its pursuit. Alistair McIntyre, in his book After Virtue, used similar imagery to describe what he perceived was the scenario in contemporary moral philosophy. Indeed, I'm following in his footsteps while paradoxically walking ahead of him, which is after all possible if we are both walking backwards as we are in history. So just to bore you with one more metaphor, in this strange scenario, I can do two things he could not. I can deepen his footprint, footprints while also fixing my eyes on our present horizon. I intend to deepen McIntyre's footprints by digging deeper down to the roots of our contemporary predicaments, sorry, <laughs> identifying the historical metaphysical roots of the dismal scenario he identified in modern moral discourse. 
and I am fixing my sight on our current horizon, both by taking into account recent welcome developments in the recovery of some aspects of the scholastic tradition, and by identifying what I think we can gain by a full recovery of this tradition, something that points us beyond this horizon, even to such trendy subjects as artificial intelligence. Contemporary analytical philosophy, a way of doing philosophy that can be characterized by a constant rigorous reflection on the philosophical uses of language, is a direct descendant of logical positivism. Logical positivism, however, was arguably the 20th century culmination of the strongest anti-metaphysical trends of post-enlightenment philosophy. Nevertheless, since the elimination of metaphysics through the logical analysis of language, Proved to, uh, to, proved to be a vain attempt. Engaging metaphysical issues with an analytical appro approach more recently turned out to be not only possible, but even desirable. Um, I hope many of you recognized in this phrase the title of uh, Rudolf Carnap's famous um, programmatic paper, um, which uh, tried to do just that the elimination of metaphysics through the logical analysis of language. But um, that uh, luckily has turned out to be a blind alley in the history of uh, uh, analytical philosophy. The development of powerful analytical tools in logical semantics, such as Kripke's possible word semantics, enabled analytic philosophers to revive the notion of essence, one of the fundamental notions of the Aristotelian metaphysical tradition. However, given the meandering historical path leading to these recent developments, it should come as no surprise that the commonly assumed modern analytic notion of essence as a collection of essential properties defined in model terms is a far cry from the traditional Aristotelian notion, namely the notion of that which establishes a thing in its individual being in its specific kind. Thus. Although many analytic philosophers routinely talk about essences, they equally routinely talk past the Aristotelian scholastic tradition. By and large, this is still the case, notwithstanding some welcome recent developments coming mostly from our historically better informed colleagues. However, I'd say the revival of some ideas of Aristotelian hylomorphism in the works of these philosophers is still only partial, showing great promise but failing to deliver what I referred to earlier as the form of the whole of the fallen <coughs> cathedral of scholastic thought. But why is that? Scholastic thought is compared to the architecture of Gothic cathedra cathedrals with good reason. The wonderful structural unity of interlocking arches running down on all sides of a Gothic vault are magnificent representations of the structural unity of interlocking concepts pervading all fields of scholastic inquiry. But remove the keystones and the vault collapses. Remove some central notions and the cathedral of thought falls into ruin. Such a conceptual keystone which held in place and was held in place by the interlocking notions of meaning, significatio, nature, natura, essentia, quintitas, and concept in scholastic Aristotelianism was the notion of form. Considered semantically, a form is what a word signifies, constituting its meaning. Metaphysically, a form is a determination of things being, establishing the thing in its singular existence in its specific nature, kind, or nature. Finally, epistemically, it is the form of the thing received in the mind that constitutes the mind's concept whereby the mind conceives of the nature of the thing signified by the word subordinated to this concept. So we have the beautiful Aristotelian semantic triangle. So I think the first step in the recovery of our missing blueprint is the full recovery of this keystone notion of form in all of these interconnected functions in its proper conceptual space. How can the notion of form serve all these diverse functions? How can it serve as this keystone in the scholastic cathedral of thought? The simple answer is that this notion is analogical. As such, 
It is in fact a cluster of closely interrelated, in fact partly overlapping concepts, each deriving from an original primitive concept. Hence its proper understanding must start with grasping this primary concept, which is the et etymologically primary meaning of the word expressing it. So what is the etymologically primary meaning of the word form? As is the case with many of our terms expressing abstract concepts, as is indeed the case with the very expression abstract concept, which comes from the ideas of pulling away, abstraher, and grasping, conceiver, the etymologically primary idea is that of something sensible. Thus, primarily, the word form, just like the Latin forma, from which the English word derives, as well as the Greek, corresponding Greek word morphe, refers to the outer shape of a body, the tangible and visible limit of its volume, determining, that is, terminating, its dimensions. But of course, this is not what a hylomorphist metaphysician would primarily mean by the word. The etymologically primary meaning of a term need not be semantically prior in accordance with the intent of a certain group of users of the term. See the medieval distinction between a quo and a quod nomen imponitur, that is that from which and that on which a name is imposed or given to. After all, a human being and a well-made mannequin or android may have the exact same looking, <laughs> feeling, uh, looking and feeling shape, yet they certainly differ in their form that determines what they are. So, what the metaphysicians primarily, what, what the metaphysician primarily means by the term form is rather what the scholastic with, uh, scholastics would call the substantial form of a thing. Well, what is that? Whenever we are in trouble with answering such a what question, we need to remember that it can be answered in two ways. First, metaphysically, determining what the thing in question is, providing the quid rei, the quiditative definition of the thing, presupposing the meaning of the term referring to the thing in question, or semantically, by saying what we mean, specifying the semantic relations between the thing we are talking about, whatever that thing is in its own nature, and the word in terms of which we are talking about it, providing the quid nominis, the nominal definition of, or of the meaning of the word, naming what we intend to talk about. And we should remember, we should also remember, that we can answer the question about the quiddity of the thing only after we manage to properly identify, um, uh, we, um, we, um, we manage to properly identify it, identify it, namely the thing, um, based on the meaning of its name. Um, here is Aquinas' advice to that effect in his commentary on the Perihermeneus. So, simply clarifying what we mean by the word, we can just bluntly say that when we are talking about the form of a thing, we mean whatever it is that makes the thing the kind of thing it is, signified by the term telling us what kind of thing it is. Of course, the making in question is not the way in which, say, a potter makes a pot or a locksmith makes a key. Rather, by the activity of making a pot or a key, these artisans bring about in the matter they are working on, say clay or iron, a form that makes the clay into a pot or an, and the iron into a key, namely, what makes the terms pot and key true of these things. So, in view of these considerations, Forms on this semantic approach are truth makers, making the terms signifying them true of the things of which they are true. Therefore, and this is meant to be just a semantic triviality, whatever it is that makes the terms pot and key true of pots and keys is a form of these things signified by these terms, and it is the actuality of these forms in these things that makes these terms true of them. The important thing about this semantic triviality is that we can safely hold on to it, regardless of whether we metaphysically know what the form signified by the term in question is. We don't have to know much, that is the uh, uh, point here. Thus, the advantage of holding on to, of holding on to this uh, semantic triviality is that we don't need to put the cart before the horse. 
We don't have to determine profound metaphysical issues at the beginning about the quiddity or nature of these forms, etc. Rather, we are simply clarifying the rules of the language in which those issues can meaningfully be raised and hopefully be answered. Nevertheless, despite my insistence on the triviality of this semantic conception and the deceptive simplicity of its application to the cases of pots and keys, one may immediately have several misgivings about it. First, how does the alleged semantic triviality that the words pot and key signify the forms of pots and keys explains the profound claim I just casually dropped in the introduction that a form is that which establishes a thing in its individual being, in its specific kind, or in other words, that a form is a determination of the being or existence uh, of such a thing. Indeed, what the heck is the existence of a thing? The question of the semantics of form and being. Second, how can this triviality produce a semantic theory, at least on a par with the ex exactitude of the paradigmatic logical semantic theory of our time, namely the semantics of predicate logic, the problem of constructing a via antiqua semantics, as I'm going to refer to this. So, in response to the first question, uh, the question of the semantics of form and being, let us cl clarify the semantics of the terms form and being, or existence, based on the suggested semantic triviality, namely that a universal term that is true of a thing signifies a form of a thing, and it is the actuality or actual existence of this form signified in the thing that makes the term true of the thing. This semantic principle, the principle of the inherent theory of predication, can be spelled out schematically as follows. A universal term F is true of a thing X, just in case the form signified by F in X is actual. Now obviously, the form signified in X by F is actually in X just in case the form actually inheres in X, as the scholastics would say, hence the name of the principle. So the term form refers to what the universal term signifies in a thing. For example, the term key signifies a form of, say, a piece of metal, and it is the actuality of this form, whatever it is, that verifies the term key of it. Now, here I have a little footnote about the not so simple uh, scenario as it may appear on the basis of this description. We should note here at once now that the shape of the key in itself would not make it a key without a matching lock it can open. So the term key is relative which would have to be taken into account in its semantics. How this can be done will be indicated later, but at this point, the particular issues, issue of the semantics of key is irrelevant. Okay, so it's, it's not necessarily just the shape <laughs> that is a form. Okay, that is just an indication of further complications that we uh, will have to face further down the, the road. But then, clearly, the actual being of this form is precisely its actuality which is signified by the ver verb of existence, namely is or exists in English. Before the piece of metal in question acquired this form in the hands of the locksmith, it could become a key, but it was not a key. This is a simple fact that Aristotelians expressed by saying that initially the form of the key was in potentiality in this piece of metal, and the work of the locksmith brought it into actuality, making this piece of metal into an actual key, which was not there before, but now it exists, because now its form brought into existence by the locksmith exists. So the being or existence of the key, what the scholastics refer to it uh, to as its essa, is nothing but what the predicate is or exists signifies in it, just as the term key signifies in it the form of the key as such. So we can just uh, specify the uh, um, previous general uh, formula for the term exists by saying that the term exists is true of a thing just in case the essa signified by exists in X is actual. And this essa is just whatever, this, whatever it is that this exists signifies in the, in the thing. Well, this suggestion may immediately face another barrage of objections from contemporary analytical philosophers. Even if it is granted that the word exists can consistently be used as a predicate of individuals, 
which after Kahn through Frege to Russell to Quine to Wiggins and many others used to be a big bone of contention, but by now it is an non-issue. Then what is its subject? Is, is it the key or is it its form? Or is the key the same thing as its form? And if the existence of the key is what the alleged existence predicate signifies in it, and the existence of, the f uh, of its form is, again, what the same alleged predicate signifies in this form, then is the existence of the key the same as the existence of the form? Finally, the form of the key is said to be a form, so the predicate form is true of it. Thus, the form of the key has a form, signified in it by the term form. And since the actual form of the key exists, and it is uh, also actually a form, the form of the form of the key also exists. Hence, we are again faced with the question of whether the existence of this form, namely the form of the form of the key, is the same as the existence of the form of the key, etc., etc. Confusing, isn't it? That was my goal. <laughs> so, such and, such and similar issues can be raised ad nauseam until we completely lose track of what we are talking about and give up on the whole game. Therefore, to prevent that outcome, we need to make our language more precise by addressing the challenge posed by the second main question of this section, namely, number two, the question of how we can turn these vague semantic suggestions into a precise logical semantics matching the exactitude of the paradigmatic logical semantics of our time namely the semantics of predicate, predicate logic or quantification theory. So, constructing a via antiqua semantics, how can we make the semantic uh, triviality of the inherent theory of predication noted above more precise, matching the standards of contemporary semantic theory? Take a simple proposition, such as Socrates is wise, which he would deny modestly, of course. The truth conditions of this proposition can be stated in several different yet equivalent ways. For instance, we can say that this proposition is true just in case Socrates is indeed wise or that the state of affairs that Socrates is, Socrates is wise obtains. However, this formulation of the condition of the truth um, of this proposition does not tell us anything about how the components of this simple proposition contribute to determining what needs to be the case to make it true. So how do the subject and a predicate, let alone the copula of this proposition, determine just what needs to be the case? Raising this further question is nothing but moving from the level of analysis of propositional logic to predicate logic. So let us see what predicate logic tells us about this issue. Following Tarski's and Wu's and others' lead, Standard logic textbooks would tell us that such a simple proposition is true just in case the individual denoted by the singular name Socrates is an element of the set denoted by the common predicate wise. By implication, this analysis attributes the semantic function of denoting an individual to the singular name and denoting a set to the common predicate. Another type of analysis, namely Frege's, uh, would assign a different function to the predicate. According to Frege's analysis, the predicate would denote a function from individuals to truth values, the true and the false, and the proposition would be true just in case for the individual denoted by the subject, the function in question would yield the value true. Now, in his seminal essay, Form and Existence, Peter Geach made the ingenious suggestion that we can fruitfully interpret several passages in Aquinas about the predicative function of common terms by assigning a different type of semantic function to the predicate, namely, a function from individual substances, such as Socrates or Plato, to their individualized forms, such as Socrates' wisdom or Plato's wisdom, whether they actually exist or not. Given this semantic function of the predicate, what makes the proposition true is just the actuality of the individualized form signified by the predicate in the individual denoted by the subject. So, without going into um, any model theoretical uh, technicalities. We can say that the same proposition, say Socrates is wise, on the Tarskan analysis is true just in case the denotation of its subject um, is an element of the denotation of its predicate, which holds on the Frege Fregean uh, analysis just in case the function denoted by the predicate yields the true for the denotation of, uh, of the subject, which in turn holds on Geach's analysis 
just in case the function denoted by the predicate yields for the thing denoted by the subject an individualized form that is actual, that is one that actually exists. So far, this is sheer semantics, simply coming up with a different type of semantic function for predicates. No metaphysics yet. Of course, assigning this type of function, uh, of this type of semantic function to the predicate involves at least two uh, unusual ontological assumptions. First, marking out a subset of the domain of set, uh, the domain as the set of individualized forms, a peculiar type of entities. And second, marking out a subset of the domain as the set of actual entities, leaving the rest in the shadowy ontological realm of non-actual individuals. Nevertheless, from the point of view of formal semantics, these are just the sort of complications one should expect when dealing with the logical modeling of some philosophically intriguing concepts. For modalities, we may need possible words. Well, we have shadowy, non-actual individuals as well. For tenses and temporal adverbs, uh, adverbs, we may need time-indexed sets of individuals. For intentional logic in general, we may need time-indexed possible words, etc. However, from the ontological point of view, it becomes at once questionable just what sort of weird entities our semantics might commit us to. But upon a bit of reflection, one may quite easily dispel this sort of worry concerning each of the above mentioned unusual ontological assumptions. As for individualized forms, they are in fact the most ordinary entities we find in our everyday experience. The shape of this ice cube, its coldness, its white color, its watery taste, are all what Aristotle, Aquinas, and innumerable other pre-modern philosophers would identify as this ice cube's individualized forms. In fact, all its sensible qualities are just individualized forms of this ice cube, the very items in external reality by which we can have some sens sensory awareness of the presence of this thing in the first place. So whoever thinks these forms are some metaphysical phantoms coming from some antiquated Aristotelian dreams about reality that have no place in our ontology informed by modern physics should wake up to the reality of the world they live in, um, of which they would have no idea without the actual presence of such forms in the first place. However, just what these forms are and how they can be identified and characterized in terms of modern science is a further issue, which should, however, however presuppose and not prejudge the semantics in terms of which we can intelligibly raise just these questions. So again, in these considerations, we must not put the metaphysical card carrying our, all our ontological valuables before the semantical horse, which is supposed to deliver those valuables only after the honest toil of unpacking them in our metaphysical disputations. Or to use again another, in fact, mixed metaphor, we must not forget that semantics only has the role of staking out the playing field in which metaphysical tournaments are played out, lest we yell out checkmate in what we think is a chess tournament upon showing a royal flush. So, if we build a recursive compositional semantics with a model theory based on Geech's suggestion, as I in fact did 30 years ago in my Ars Artium, um, it's a small booklet, full of formulae in case you are interested, <laughs> it's available. <laughs> then we get an extremely fine grade semantics that not only matches, but even surpasses in expressive power the standard systems of intentional logic in currency today. I must note then that Geech's suggestion has to be refined and supplemented in several ways to be genuinely usable for such purposes. For instance, since actuality among generable and corruptible things is obviously relative to time, and so forms are individualized not only by their subject but also by time, another argument reserved for a temporal variable is clearly needed in a refined version of Geech's function. This move, of course, calls for further structure for distinguishing various sorts of non-actual elements of the domain of our model since now we can distinguish items that were, are, will, or will be actual, 
and those that could have been, could be, or will be able to be actual, as well as those that could not, cannot, and or will not be able to be actual, yielding precisely the kind of rich distinctive model that is just the ordinary frame of reference of most of scholastic metaphysical discussions, as well as most of our ordinary practical reasons. So this is the sort of ontological framework which I usually refer to as the quasi-ontology of um, the, the uh, antiqua semantics. That is, um, of scholastic uh, uh, philosophers, logicians, theologians, etc., working before the advent of alchemist nominalism. Okay, we need not uh, go into the details of this now, perhaps in the discussion period. So, Indeed, as we can see, this rich frame of reference can accommodate not only individual substances and their individualized forms as the significance of their true predicates, whether uh, those are their real forms or mere beings of reason, but also universal forms, again, in the domain of beings of reason, in perfect agreement with Aristotle's and his commentator's doctrine of the categories. However, following Nietzsche's inspiring suggestion, consists not simply in appending a new subdomain to our universe of discourse, but rather in providing, again, a precise conceptual tool for keeping track of the crucial items in medieval discussions of universals, but strictly, <laughs> by strictly distinguishing individualized forms as the values of the signification function of a common term from the corresponding universal form, abstracted from their individual conditions, their subject and time, namely the signification function of the common term, in question its, uh, common term in question itself, obtainable by the mathematically precisely defined operation of functional abstraction. The items thus obtained, then, in our form of semantics can serve as precisely identifiable items in our universe of discourse, modeling universals as the immediate significance of our common terms as opposed to their ultimate significance, the individualized forms. These items, then, can be treated as mere objects of reason, that is, objects we can think of even if they do not exist in the abstract way in which we can think of them. As such, they are regarded not as subject to variation with the variation of individuals or time, since they are obtained, they are obtained precisely by abstracting from these, and so they have to reside in a domain of items to be sharply distinguished from the domain of real beings, which are the only type of items that can be said to have actual real existence. Um, they are here. This is actual physical reality right now. Okay, and because, because time passes. Okay, and I understand that my time is passing too. So. Uh, let me speed things up a little bit. Um, but the whole point of all these technicalities is that they offer mathematically precisely defined, clearly, clearly traceable items to, to stand in for our otherwise hard to catch items in our metaphysical discussions. Indeed, so much so that these set theoretical ersatz items, functions and their values, can easily be fed into the quasi-ontologies of artificial intelligence machines, which then, with an appropriately defined validity checker, can at once produce all, no matter how weird, implications of any of our claims. Well, am I endorsing now delegating our metaphysical discussions to AI machines? Of course not. What I'm suggesting instead is that using this technical machinery, um, can help not only us, human thinkers, keep track of what we are doing, much like using a system of numerals along with the algorithms for their manipulation helps us keep track of our calculations, but it can also be helpful by feeding it into AI systems doing natural language processing, much like feeding our numeral system and its algorithms into our calculators so we don't have to slog through the boring process of a long division using pen and paper, right? In fact, the natural logic of the scholastics captured in this system um, in a machine processable form 
can teach these AI systems much of the workings of human language and thought. Indeed, in this, in this teaching process, we can also learn a great deal about what is and what is not teachable to a machine. In any case, we can be quite certain that in this process, it will always be the creative human intelligence that takes the lead, and for which I have the proof referred to in the footnote. <laughs> this is a paper um, we wrote together with um, um, a professor of um, electric engineering from Texas um, based on um, Aquinas's argument for the immateriality of the human intellect, arguing that uh, there are certain uh, intellectual functions, intellective functions of the human mind um, that cannot be realized in a material medium, which is why no material machine will ever be able to produce those functions or even mimic them. Okay, so that's another thing. Um, and artificial intelligence will always be dependent on the natural human intelligence for the latter's creativity in forming the concepts that, the, that then can be used for fast, precise processing by an AI system. In any case, the possibility of using the scholastic's natural logic for producing more intelligent AI systems is just another illustration of what awaits us on the horizon if we manage to achieve using Gadamer's catchy phrase, the fusion of our horizons with our scholastic tradition. So, to return in closing to my somewhat weird opening metaphor, walking backwards while facing forward, we can reach a point from which we can catch a glimpse of the outlines of the entirety of a Gothic cathedral of thought. We still need to build and chisel, yet one that is not in ruins, one that does not exist only in romantic fantasies based on scattered museum pieces, but one that is fully functioning, its gateway pointing the way toward the future in which our children, working in their present toward their future, will never be so alienated from our past as we have been throughout much of our modern history.